Welcome back. The peace community of San Jose de Patador paid a high price for its decision to remain neutral. But what other choices are available to people living under a permanent threat of violence? Renata Rendon went back a year after the massacre to see how the community was coping. In September 2006, I flew to Urabá. Because of the guerrilla and paramilitary presence in the region, military checkpoints are a troublesome reality for the people who live here. Good morning. Could you please let us check your car? I ask the soldier what the situation is like beyond the checkpoint. We have not had major problems. All the roads are protected. There is a lot of security. Humberto, the driver, has a different view of the situation, telling us that being an innocent civilian navigating between the different armed groups in this region is complex and dangerous. I live here, and the guerrilla makes a checkpoint that can last three, four, five months, and I end up living together with them, getting to know them, and you end up becoming friends with them. Then the paramilitary comes and makes a checkpoint, and you get to know them. And then the army comes, and they do the same thing. So one of those three groups sees you have become friendly with another one, and then they retaliate because they think you were helping the other group. The first thing I am reminded of when I arrive back in the peace community of San Jose de Apartado is that they have been displaced. They're living in a new area on a patch of land about a kilometer away from the old village. I meet members of the peace community's governing council who welcome me back and they begin to explain how the government continues to disregard their position of neutrality. When the government says the police or the military need to enter our community, we are not going to accept that. Our response is, okay, if you do that, we will move, even if we have to leave our houses. We are not exposing ourselves to get killed in combat. Combat happens at any time, and the ones who are affected are us, the civilians, the children. The leaders are keenly aware of how vulnerable they are. The aim of the armed group is to involve us in a conflict. And we have made it very clear that weapons do not solve the social problems that humanity suffers. Brigida Gonzalez knows firsthand the pain of being caught up in Colombia's dirty war. She has been a leader since the community's inception and is an inspiration to all who follow her path of nonviolence. But something has changed since I left. Brigida's daughter, Elisenia, who I knew well, went to a nearby village for a Christmas party. She never returned. She was only 15. I asked my daughter not to go because there was a threat, and I was afraid something was going to happen. But before she left, my daughter told me, if something happens, it can happen anywhere, so I have to live my life. I was overwhelmed when I realized that she had been killed. Elisenia cared deeply about peace. These are the certificates that she was awarded. One for constructing peace. And one for her studies. The army does not deny killing Elisenia, but they claim that she was a guerrilla killed in combat. Nobody has been brought to justice for her murder. We know that in Colombia there is no justice for civilian population. 
justice means to kill civilians. In the face of ongoing threats against the community, Brígida continues to speak out about the murder of her daughter. And we know that those threats become true. But we won't step back. We will not die kneeling down. We will die standing. After hearing of Elisenia's death, it becomes painfully clear to me that the cycle of violence and terror continues. Hildardo offers to take me to the home of another victim, deep in the Colombian jungle. He says the trip will give me a more complete picture of what the community has faced since I left. It's a grueling and dangerous trip, one that few foreigners ever make. The further we go into the jungle, the greater the risk. There's guerrilla presence, there's military, paramilitary, combat, um, you know, transfer of arms, drugs. Despite the danger, the passage through the remote Colombian jungle is breathtaking. In a few hours, we arrive at the small wooden room that had been home to Edilberto Vasquez Cardona before he was kidnapped and killed last year. When Edilberto woke up to start the fire and make breakfast, the army took him and killed him. How do you know it was the army? The army had come before and asked Edilberto to inform them where the guerrilla were. Edilberto told them, I cannot do that, because if I do, I would become an informant, and that makes me a target. So the army took him, killed him, and in the report, they said Edilberto was a guerrilla killed in combat. The army said that neutrality in this region needs to finish. The story begins to become hauntingly repetitive. Death, displacement, and killers who never fear punishment. After the February 2005 massacre, the Colombian government installed a police post in the center of town against the wishes of the community. It put them in the line of fire. The police said that the community had to accept the post or there will be no community. Now, the village of San Jose de Apartado is half empty. Many doors are padlocked. Only a few stores remain. And there aren't many people for the police to protect. The community neither accepts the police post, nor will we disintegrate. We could be under a tree, or a bridge, or even a rock. But as long as we are together, we are the community. They remain together, now living in the fenced-off area a kilometer away. The police post commander says his men play a positive role here. The police role in San Jose de Apartado is to support the community and to defend ourselves when necessary. As the community predicted, the FARC attacked the police post after its installation. The commander shows me the bullet holes. The community doesn't understand why you put a police post here when they are against weapons of any kind. In every country there is a police. We all use weapons and a government has a right to put police wherever they want in their country. Well, that would be true if we had a legitimate government and we do not. If the police and the army respected human rights, if they did not hurt us or massacre us, they could be wherever they want. This fight over one police post in one village is a microcosm of the bigger issues, of local control, of the right to remain neutral, 
of the right to reject the government's so-called protection. No. On my last afternoon in the community, I accompany Brihida to the cemetery, where a year and a half earlier, we both attended the burial of Luis Eduardo Guerra and seven others. But we can't get to Luis Eduardo's grave because the cemetery is overgrown with weeds. Brihida says it's because the police regularly patrol the cemetery, often denying peace community members access to the grave sites. It is an added cruelty, preventing family and friends from visiting the graves of their loved ones. It hurts me because a leader of this community who spoke with so much confidence and clarity ends up here, and we cannot come here to clean up his tomb and talk to him. I came back to the peace community hoping that security had improved since the February 2005 massacre, but it has not. The investigation into the massacre is still unsolved. The killers remain at large. I've often thought that one day the people would simply give up and take up arms in self-defense. But I know now that their fight for justice and to protect their right to remain outside of Colombia's brutal war has only begun. On my last night in the peace community, everyone comes out to eat sancocho, a traditional Colombian soup made of potatoes, plantains, spices, and chicken. We dance under the moonlight. And for a brief moment, all the violence and death seem to fade back into the jungle. To date, no one has been charged in connection with the murders. But in February this year, the Colombian Attorney General's office called on 69 government soldiers to testify in connection to the massacre. The community was nominated for the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. That's it for this edition. I hope you'll join me next time for Witness.